Welcome back to Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Fimioner, and today on Intersection, we're taking a closer look at the causes of poverty in Missouri, specifically among the working poor, and talking about what's being done to try to bring folks out of poverty. Joining us in studio today, Jeanette Mott-Oxford is the Executive Director of the Missouri Association for Social Welfare and a former state representative. Sandy Raccoon is a professor in MU's Department of Rural Sociology and is the Director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security, which just published its 2013 version of the Hunger Missouri Hunger Atlas. And Matt Folks is an associate professor in the MU Department of Geography. He also worked on the Hunger Atlas project and tracks the migration patterns and behaviors of the rural poor. And for you and our audience, should Missouri raise its minimum wage? Why or why not? Share your thoughts. Give us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You can also tweet at intersect kbia. And we do have a lot of great uh, interaction coming on chat rooms and on callers. We'll have a caller we'll bring on here in just a second. But first, I want to bring on this comment from Bill. Uh, he said, I'm going to be the bad guy here. Frankly, I'm getting tired of hearing about the single mother with four children who's trying to feed the family on minimum wage. I'm all f- I'm all for providing educational opportunities to help her improve her life, but I question the benefits of providing open-ended support, particularly if it's an apparent it's apparent that she was making minimum wage when she had one child or two or three. All of us must bear the responsibilities of the decisions we make. Minimum wage was never designed to feed a family of five, and I think it's vital to get the simple point across that if you can't afford the babies, don't have them. We can't continue to offer the reward of more money for more children. Open that up for discussion. (laughs) I certainly would choose for every one of us, male or female, to be sexually responsible and to plan carefully when we have children. Uh, However, what the data says is that the, the, uh, the less aid that someone receives, like in terms of welfare benefits, the more, the higher the fertility rate is for those states. So for example, um, the, the states in New England tend to be a little more generous in their, their welfare payments and they have fewer children per caseload than uh, we do in in Missouri, where we're near the bottom of the nation and where our welfare benefits are. We haven't raised them since 1991. Maximum check is for family three is $292 a month since 1991, when the check went up $3 from where it was in 1975. So, uh, you know, talk about programs that get stuck and just aren't moved because it's not politically popular. That's that's one. So we could say, well, let's just stop aid and then people won't have babies. But actually, that it works the opposite way. And it, and the reason for that is when you are desperate and uh, and poor and you're a woman, you go looking for uh, Mr. Right to, to pull you out of uh, poverty. And often um, a baby results from that search for somebody to come get me out of this mess, me and my kids. Uh, and life doesn't always work out right. Unfortunately, uh, a whole lot of folks have... Uh, grown up with a whole lot of bad modeling and uh, experienced a whole lot of abuse and don't know how to stand up for themselves yet. So mm-hmm. how do we provide some support so that people can make better choices? That would be my question. And I, and I would actually go back to something Jeanette said earlier about I, I, well, I, I, I guess agree with Bill's frustration. And, you know, obviously people, it seems from the outs- outside that that's a frustrating situation, uh, you know, that there's a incentive there. But um, it seems that we're holding the poor to a higher standard again. You know, people make, you know, I guess, uh, fiscally irresponsible decisions all the time <laughs> at all levels of, of income. And it seems that, you know, we're uh, you know, to hold those folks to a higher level, a higher standard than the rest of us is, is a bit unfair. And I will say that I don't, you know, it, based on what we were talking about earlier, the, the programs now are designed are, are pretty uh, – Closed ended, they're not open ended, uh, and uh, yes, there you know benefits may increase with with increased family size, but um, there's all sorts of strings attached. You know those benefits are smaller, as we talked about. Um, you know, so the the percentage of monies that are going to these families is is shrinking, and so if if anything, I mean, I think you know that that has happened anyways, and uh, so I, I I you know I I don't I, I think that's it's it's useful to think about that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to go ahead and bring on Jeffrey has been waiting very patiently uh, to chime in. Jeffrey, are you there on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you very much for calling in. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, yeah, what, what, what do you want to talk about today? I want to talk about hunger in Missouri. I want to talk about all of this. I totally agree that we need to raise the minimum wage and that um, we need to do everything we can, philanthropy, um, the, uh, legislatively, um, Oh, just employment, just, just a holistic spectrum needs to invert itself. You know, from 
from a corporatistic plutocratic paradigm to one that is that is based on putting people first. You know, that's that's all. Okay. You know. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Or, uh, Jeffrey, thanks yes. very much for calling in. I appreciate it. I, I mean, you know, Jeanette, you've been a state legislator before. He mentioned legislatively. I mean, how does how do changes like this occur, and what are some of the barriers for for actual change in some of these uh, these standards? I guess. Well, um, I think there's a lot that we could do that would reduce hunger with public policy. Uh, for example, um, we haven't meaningfully updated the income guidelines for subsidized childcare since 1991. We could modernize those so that people don't lose their access to affordable child care just because they get a small raise at work. Uh, the, the, the minimum wage at the federal level uh, could be indexed to the cost of living. That would be helpful. Uh, here in Missouri, we uh, took, uh, uh, took the power in our own hands and did a petition drive to increase the, the state minimum wage a few years ago and indexed to, that, to the cost of living. So it does go up some. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think, you know, there was an effort recently to do that again, and it uh, failed by a narrow margin around collecting enough signatures, and really there were enough signatures, but the problem was it kind of, uh, it, we ran out of time connected to uh, the, the core challenge was what happened there. So uh, it could be that there's, there'll be another effort to try to raise the minimum wage by petition drive, if, if nothing else. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot that we, we could do. We could create an earned income tax credit at the state level, not just the federal level. Uh, we could update our uh, outdated, unfair, inadequate tax system in Missouri, where the tax table hasn't changed since 1931, and our top tax bracket starts at $9,000 a year of taxable income, which was a lot of money in 1931, but it's not much money now. So there's a lot that we could do. Unfortunately, our legislature spends a lot of time debating fantasy problems instead of real problems, and I'd like to see that change. Sandy? I'd just like to emphasize the first point she made. I mean, she used the example of child care, but... I think what, what we have to understand is that, that people with limited resources have to make trade-offs very mm -hmm. often That's between right. money for food versus money for housing, money for utilities, uh, money for health care and medicine, yes, and money for gasoline. Mm -hmm. So the better our policies are and, and, and the more protected people are from having very high health care costs or medical costs, because when they have those costs, money for food just goes by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the strength of the safety net, mm -hmm. uh, the strength of, of the health care system and people's participation, if they're not participating in that, if they're, util if they're living in substandard housing where their utility bills are off the charts, I mean, they have to pay their utilities at, at some point. They might skip a month, but they have to pay. So food is, is sacrificed. And so, the str so in terms of policy and legislature and programs, when people slip through the cracks on all these other things, food suffers. There. And is that something you've seen in, in your work, those like real examples of that? Of those trade-offs? Trade yeah. I mean, we've done a lot of interviews with, with households that use food, uh, food pantries. And I can't remember the number, but probably between 70 and 80% yeah. of the families that use those have to make these trade-offs. Right. When you go to a food pantry, generally you get about a three-day supply. Uh, and food stamps provide $1.40 per person per meal. Right now it's going to go down to around $1.30 per person per meal in November because of some federal changes. Could go down farther than that, depending on what happens with this uh, farm bill debate uh, that you referenced at the beginning. Um, so the food pantries that, uh, that are already having trouble uh, having enough food for people to come to their doors are apt to have even more people coming uh, because of these changes in federal law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, and I don't know how to address this from a policy perspective, but I know in, in my work looking at um, how migration, you know, concentrates poverty uh, in, in rural areas that, um, you know, what happens that sometimes in, in some small towns is that the town becomes very poor very quickly because of, you know, migration of, of folks to their community because, uh, usually because of housing, because there's affordable housing in those communities. And uh, that, of course, changes the dynamic of the community and, and the community support systems that probably used to be in place are no longer there through economic attrition. And so you have very you know desperate people kind of clustered in one space. Um, and there's not the kind of, you know, community support, um, you know, kind of infrastructure to, to help those folks mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I think we all would like to see. You know, it's not just, you know, the state government. We like to see, uh, you know, networks at all levels assisting mm -hmm. folks. Um, and a lot in a lot of small towns in Missouri that you know that has been stripped away. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, and and you, you know, you're getting at that. You mentioned earlier the enrollment levels at SNAP and things like that. Do we know why? Because there, there are people that qualify for these mm-hmm. that aren't enrolled, correct? Right. And, sure. and, and I wh- think it's wh- stigma in some cases. Um, people are, uh, don't want their neighbor to know um, that, that they are Maybe stigma. asking for government assistance. I, yeah, for you know, the North Missouri example I, I cited, a fair amount of elderly qualify, but mm-hmm. they qualify for limited benefits. Right. Uh, because there's there's so many rules actually associated with SNAP and, and assets and if you're an immigrant and if you're this, if you're that. And, you know, you can quickly fall down from maximum benefits to, you know, $50 a month or $30 a month or $70 a month. And then people say, you know, the transaction costs of doing that are difficult or the office is so far away and, and right. I live in a rural area and I don't have transportation. Uh, and so I think there, there are... Uh, there's a combination of factors, right. but stigma is, is is one. Luckily, they've gone to the debit cards. That's probably helped a little bit mm-hmm. in some stores. Mm-hmm. But uh, is, is a flip side of that pride too? Do you think for some people not wanting to? Well, make I, that I, step? I remember back before I was a state representative when I was director of a statewide anti-poverty group that I actually you know did meet some people that when this, this was when we didn't have the electronic EBT EBT cards that looked like a credit card you had the paper coupons they'd actually you know drive out of their home county to another place to mm-hmm. shop because they didn't want anybody to see them shopping with food stamps so a lot of people do have a lot of pride about it um, so I, I think that that is one factor okay yeah, yeah, I, think, I think that's that's true I mean yeah you know, the, these stigmas are, are very real and they're very damaging. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, in obviously in recessions, you know, that it may give people, you know, more cover um, as more people may, I say may, I'm mm-hmm. not sure, you know, because more people are supposedly suffering, you know. Then in boom times are really hard on the poor because, um, you know, a lot of folks look around and say, well, you know, I, I'm doing well. You know, why, why, why can't these people, you know, and there's, there's this distinction, these people, you know, mm-hmm. do well, do well also. But um, we, we've, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been in meetings where I've kept a little hash mark uh, <laughs> on my paper for the number of times the phrase these people get said. It's very, I, yeah. I've seen it go up to, I think 36 was my, the most oh, in God. an hour that I ever managed to count. <laughs> well, I want to go ahead and bring in a few more comments from uh, people in the chat room. And thank you very much for patiently leaving those out there for us. Another one, I'll bring in another one from Idris because it's kind of similar to what we're talking about here. She said, uh, I grew up in a working poor family. We never received program benefits because we moved around so often. One parent worked and the other gave my five siblings and I a terrific family upbringing. Because my parents were willing and able to do what needed to be done when it needed to be done. My family climbed out of near poverty to solidly middle, solidly middle class. I honestly don't see many people willing to put forth that much effort to achieve something like that now. Um, I don't know if, if that's that. I see people idea. doing it all yeah. the time. I mean, folks, yeah. the, the majority of folks who who do go on to food stamps or on to TANF do manage to, you know, at least have spells off. Uh, and many of them, you know, go on to, to not go back to using those programs. So there are many, many success stories out there, but we don't focus on those. We uh, we we find the uh, story that reinforces the stereotype and we tell those over and over, and, uh, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that I, I think that's true. I mean, I think there's lots of uh, poverty is a transient state for many. It's not something you know. And there's other folks who are you know intergenerational poverty. But um, so for many people, it's it's you know it is bad times or bad circumstances, and they do climb. There's many success stories. And I would say to the the comment. I mean, I think we it's all it's. I think I think it's useful to think about you know, both like where you know the family's efforts contribute to climbing out of poverty and. And what other you know benefits that our structures, our lucky circumstances of might have helped those people too? And I'm not saying this uh, responder is their family was lucky, but uh, you know when you're poor, things everything has to go right, and to to have a success story, you know the margin of error is very small. Yeah. You can't make bad decisions, and so uh, luckily the commoner's family made the right decisions and was successful. But mm-hmm. what was the economic climate at the time? What was you know were there any programs? Was there you know benefits where there are nearby jobs, you know, there's so many factors that maybe are maybe out of people's control that can, you know, contribute to success stories. 
I'll take a moment to remind our listeners that this is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Fumioner, and today on Intersection, we're taking a closer look at the causes of poverty in Missouri, specifically among the working poor, and talking about what's being done to try to bring folks out of poverty. Joining us in studio today, Jeanette Mott-Oxford is the Executive Director of the Missouri Association for Social Welfare and a former state representative. Sandy Raccoon is a professor in MU's Department of Rural Sociology and is the Director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security, which just published its 2013 version of the Missouri Hunger Atlas. And Matt Folks is an associate professor in the MU Department of Geography. He also worked on the Hunger Atlas project and tracks the migration patterns and behaviors of the rural poor. For you and our audience, what are your thoughts on the debate over the accessibility of food stamps in the U.S. Congress? Let us know by giving us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at Intersect KBIA. We have a couple comments on that, somewhat somewhat of that theme. I'll throw a few of them at you right now and see what you guys have, what you would like to say about them. But one was from Renee. She says, I see where politicians and others who make the decisions that are supposed to represent the citizen are willing to bail out corporations that are too big to fail. But when it comes to actually helping people, politicians don't see the payoff. After all, poor people don't tend to donate to campaigns. Mm. Another comment from Paul says, I don't think the people who are upset by these programs realize just how little money the average recipient receives and how little that money actually buys as food prices have risen. Mm. I agree with that, especially a lot. I I agree with both of them. But the last one, what's also important is how much not paying attention to them costs society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'll just quote one study that suggested that food insecurity uh, in Missouri, if you just add up three areas of cost, one is uh, avoidable health care costs. So people who are food insecure uh, recover more slowly from illnesses uh, and so on. Uh, You add to that special education and other uh, additional requirements for schools Mm -hmm. having to deal with with children whose development is slowed or who are missing school. Mm -hmm. And then the cost of 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 charity, of, Mm -hmm. of private systems, in Missouri, two years ago, was $3.6 billion, mm-hmm. uh, far above the cost of the programs in the state that people complain are, are sometimes too high. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, that that commenter was exactly correct. And and people often don't see the costs, though, that are involved by not paying attention mm-hmm. to the program. Mm-hmm. Jenner, Matt, you want to jump in on those thoughts well, or anything I'm, those comments? I'm real concerned. Uh, I'll be interested to see what your next version of the Hunger Atlas shows because – uh, I don't know if you all are discussing yet the reorganization of the Department of Social Services offices, but uh, right now there's um, understaffing uh, drastically. Mm-hmm. Some of those county offices, uh, uh, it would appear, will be closing, and really? they'll, they're going to go to a different way of having um, processing centers. And there's this belief that people will apply online, but I haven't found that uh, folks with low incomes uh, have uh, quite as good of access to computers or as much comfort in using them. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if a lot of people, you know, we were talking about elders that don't apply now because it seems too complicated for the amount of money that you get. Maybe they were on once and then they, the hassle of getting recertified made them think, "Ah, I'm not going to do this or whatever. Uh, so if, if you have to actually find someone with a computer that will help you figure out how to log in and how to create a username and a passcode. And then you get kicked off of the system a few times because of the glitchy things that happen in systems. Uh, How many people who could qualify for food stamps may not in the future because they don't manage to to access an online application process? Yeah, I mean, I I do think there is a double standard. I agree completely, you know, with Renee that, um, you know, a lot of times with the corporate welfare, as it's sometimes Mm -hmm. called, which is another loaded term, but this idea that of, you know, tax breaks and other benefits to corporations, there's this notion that. You know, those corporations are job creators, but, you know, it's true. Like the people don't think about, as Sandy said, the cost of of not uh, taking care of people. And it, it it's, again, this sort of notion that, um, you know, the uh, deserved versus undeserving, you know, and, and who's deserving of, of society's benefits. But I completely agree with the, the other commenter. This is such a small change, actually, in the the big kind of federal budget picture. I mean, this, and I don't have the, the percentages with me, but if you look at some of the other things we spend money on, you know, this be in some ways arguing over, you know, nickels and dimes in some way. 
Hmm. We have a, yeah. another comment from James in the chat room that I wanted to bring in. He says, raising a minimum wage isn't the answer. Most minimum wage jobs are on the retail fast food level. Retailers aren't going to take a hit on their profits, so they'll raise their prices to offset costs. This ends up creating a wash for the minimum wage earner who isn't any better off after getting a raise because he's now paying more. The person it affects most is the middle class wage earner who doesn't get an automatic raise and now has to pay more for products and services. You say to that kind of argument. Well, uh, I, I think, um, again, it's about where are our values, that, there, that there's a really high uh, CEO compensation in some of the companies that uh, pay a small amount. I'd like to see that shifted uh, somewhat. And, and maybe, you know, as some of the fast food workers lately have been uh, going on strikes and demanding $15 an hour. Maybe you really can't make that business work at that level. But what I'd like to see is uh, a fair minimum wage that's, that gets adjusted for increases in the cost of living and uh, um, income guidelines for helping programs like affordable housing or food, for food stamps or subsidized child care that enable people to have the essentials of life. Because when they don't, we all hurt for it. Uh, if, if, uh, if your neighbor is, is uh, um, you know, if, 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 if kids are missing school because their families are periodically homeless, if children aren't doing well in school because uh, they were hungry or they were too cold to sleep last night, we all pay for these things. So um, I'd like to see a combination of a fair wage and a helping system that's based on income guidelines that tell the truth. Yeah, I would Matt. agree. I, I think that it's, um, you know, that I, I, I know there's a lot of debate about, you know, what the effect of raising the minimum wage is, uh, but I, on uh, all sorts of different aspects of society. But I, I think that, um, you know, there, there is some question, you know, about the, that relationship and that, you know, if you just raise minimum wage, there is some sort of absorption that will, will happen and that, you know, it's not necessarily that everything will, will go up. Uh, and um, and, it, and it's true that it wouldn't be the completely efficient because there's many middle class uh, uh, minimum wage earners, but um, it still would be very effective. So I think it is a question of values and morals. And and a lot of times I hear critics of the minimum wage, but I don't really hear good alternatives other than you know market based alternatives that mm -hmm. that that haven't quite borne out. So I think you know. Just the assumption that it's it, it's going to raise all prices in the for the middle class and, and uh, retail goods, for example, is not always true because mm -hmm. of reasons of the way companies are structured. Um, it really depends. And then there's the stimulus effect for the economy when people right. at the bottom can buy more things. It's a very complicated question, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sandy. I, I would just note, or observe that there's a, an interesting conversation that should take place one day. We don't have enough time here today. But no, I've got about six minutes left. It's really, it's really. <laughs> some people are talking about fairness. What's fair to me because I'm middle class or I've worked hard and why should I suffer because somebody else is not working here? Between what are some basic human rights? I mean, she's talking about basic rights to food and, and housing and, you know, equitable, you know, in a democratic society, what should people have, have you know, the right of access to? Which is not an issue of fairness, okay? But fairness, can, fairness is in the eyes of the beholder. But rights are some thing you know that that we need to talk about. But it's much it's a bit of a, more of a moral issue than mm -hmm. the concept of fairness, which is an interpretive issue. When you talk about these kinds of jobs, though, what should policy be focusing on? Should it be focusing on creating just more higher paying jobs or more of these you know minimum wage type jobs, even if minimum wage is higher? What what, what should we look for as a as a possible solution? I guess which which of those types of options are better? I guess. Well. Uh, well, we know that, you know, that uh, I think uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and, you know, there's lots of different organizations to put out whether where the fastest job growth is and it depends on how you measure it. But, you know, a lot of the fastest growing jobs are not by nature right now high wage jobs. You know, some of them are, but some of them aren't like home health care aides, uh, retail sales folks, um, you know, food workers, food prep. You know, these are fast growing areas. And, um, and so, you know, just... Uh, in the short term, you know, just, you know, having people acquire skills, you know, is, you know, may not, you know, not be that effective. You know, the, it's the wage structure of those jobs that is, is the issue. Um, longer term policy, you know, a lot of politicians, I think on both sides of the aisle, talk about the, the job mix. And that's, you know, and how to, you know, both make society more skilled in aggregate, so or on average, so that, you know, better jobs are attracted to the United States. Um, and I think that's, you know... That's probably a, a worthy goal.
But mm-hmm. um, you know, I think it's it's in the short term. You know, just saying, oh, you know, training programs, for example, you know, it's it's a little bit problematic. I think we, we just have a few minutes left, but we do have another caller on the line. And I wanted to bring on uh, Kent is on the line. Kent, are you there? Yes. All right. Thanks for calling in. Uh, no problem. Yeah, I just had a, a comment. Um, I'm a young fellow here in, in Columbia. I go to school and have a family and everything, and I'm on food stamps. And first of all, I'd like to say, you know, how appreciative I am of that service there. And second of all, I'd like to draw attention to the other economic benefits of food stamps, like the fact that my employer can pay me half as much as I would need otherwise because I'm on food stamps, which benefits him and his business. Mm. And also the fact that all that money that is coming from food stamps is going to all these grocery stores here in our community, which benefits them. Right. Yeah, Kent, thank you very much for calling in and sharing that. I appreciate it. uh, Millions and millions of dollars a month that get spent in local local economies because of food stamps. Yeah, and there's a multiplier. I, for, I don't remember the multiplier yeah, it's offhand. Something like a, uh, I want to say dollar seventeen, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it might be yeah. higher. I was thinking dollar thirty. That could be right. Yeah. We, we had another question. I have that at my oh, office. If anybody wants to, <laughs> we had another question. Email me we have a couple minutes here, and this was, I thought this was a good question. Someone called in with over the phone as well. Um, they were asking uh, if the panelists here think that government assistance programs offer enough to help people emerge from poverty or just enough to keep people in poverty. Mm. What are your thoughts on that, Jeanette? I think the the, the way we've set up the rules is uh, they are more apt currently to trap people in poverty, unfortunately. Mm. And and a lot of that, again, is 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 this uh, whole patchwork of earnings rules. Uh, you know, you can only get uh, Medicaid as an adult in Missouri uh, uh, if you make less than 19% of the poverty level, uh, but children are more popular, so you can have uh, school breakfasts and lunches up to 225% of the poverty level. So why not have income guidelines that are honest about what the true cost of living is and enable people to combine earnings uh, and subsidies of various kinds so that they get to an adequate standard of living? When when people are deprived of the basics of life, it has costs for our whole society. Mm-hmm. I mean, a, 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 a proponent might say, well, we're just trying to prevent fraud, right? That's why we need to have all these rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when you set rules that you can't survive uh, on them as, the, as they are set up, I have trouble calling it fraud because you were really, you were really trying to help your kids survive. Uh, that, that's kind of different to me. Okay. Um, I don't want fraud in any program uh, at, at any, any level of government, uh, but we ought to have honest rules. It's another one of these perceptions, I think, that fraud is prevailing in welfare programs, but non-existent everywhere else, and uh, are you know holding you know welfare programs higher. But uh, I, I mean, I agree. I think that you know you you either have to go two ways with this. Like I think you have to either say, you know, that the programs need to be a lot more generous; they lift people out of poverty, or you need to go completely free market. You know, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I think um, which is like take out. You know, corporate welfare take out, you know, kind of more of the libertarian argument, which I don't agree with at all. But I don't like right now, I think it's in the middle, you know, like so what I'm saying is, you know, because there's welfare happening at all levels of society. So um, I, I don't personally don't think that would work. But I think that um, right now, I agree, it's 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 we're kind of in the middle and it keeps, you know, the system kind of keeps people. Uh, it does definitely doesn't lift them out of poverty, you know, uh, everybody at least. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we have about 20, 30 seconds left here, but what, what are some of the things that could, I mean, what kind of changes? If you had could change one thing tomorrow, poof, what would it be to try to address that? Well, I I think the uh, for, for the working poor, the earned income tax credit has been an incredibly mm-hmm. successful program, and, uh, you know, continuing to get the, the earnings rules right on that would be one thing to do. Mm-hmm. I think benefits indexed inflation. Mm-hmm. And my opinion is to try to control costs related to non-food expenditures. I'm thinking especially of medicine, health care, and housing. Mm-hmm. If we could keep those in check, then people would have additional income to spend on food. I'd vote for any of you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, guys. That's that's all the time we have for today. Or today's On Intersection. Where, thanks to our guests, Jeanette Mott oxford uh, Sandy Raccoon, and Matt Folks. Uh, we'd like to remind those of you listen, enjoying this is rebroadcast that Intersection takes place live for a full hour from 2 to 3 every Monday afternoon. You can watch live streaming video of our program each Monday afternoon online at kbia.org. Alongside that video, you can submit your questions and comments and take part in an online discussion with others in the audience. You'll also find an archive of all of our past programs, including the full hour of today's conversation. Intersection's a broadcast from the Reynolds Journalism Institute and a project of RJI and KBIA. Intersection's produced by Raymond Tungakar, Janet Saidi, Ruben Stern, and Casey Morrell. Travis McMillan's our technical 
technical director. I'm Ryan from Thanks for joining us this week.